This was Bury in the early 60s, the great dome of the Victorian Market Hall dominating the shopping centre. And beneath, the large open market, popular far beyond the borough boundaries. Princess Street, crowded with small shops to cater for most needs. at the older town. And below School Brower it was still possible to see a steam train. His plans were underway to sweep away the labyrinth of old Victorian streets within the old town. It began in Turf Street, near today's fish market, with the demolition of Hall and Nielsen's brake lining work. Soon familiar buildings in Hager Street and around Union Square were falling to the relentless bulldozer.
Beyond the sun, Taboot's new building in the rock was under construction. And another famous corner, that of Haymarket Street and Market Street, was soon to pass into history. Derby Hall, as in 1963 buildings were demolished to make way for the construction of Leicester House. September the 29th, 1964, the Derby Hotel in the marketplace finally closed its doors. It has served the town and some of its most distinguished visitors for 116 years. The Earl of Derby had commissioned a leading architect, Sidney Smirk, to design the building, together with the Derby Hall and the Athenaeum, and the opening up of Market Street. following year the hotel had gone and the site was prepared for a new building, Ribblesdale House. Already looking towards spring, 
Merry people were suddenly plunged into midwinter again when a freak snowstorm hit the town towards the end of March. A fall of several inches was quickly turned to slush by heavy town centre traffic and shoppers had to pick their way carefully through decidedly unseatable conditions. of the previous contest once more sought local support. Mr David Ensor, who in the last election became the first Labour member for Bury, again stood for re-election. Mr John C Bidgood, member for the constituency until his defeat in 1964, aimed to regain the seat for the Conservatives. And Bolton-born Mr Charles L Scholes once more stood as candidate for the Liberals. of attention as the ballot boxes began to arrive. candidates arrived to await the verdict. announcement, the three candidates spoke in turn the final words to their supporters. Mr. Good, it 
was his last campaign, for he announced later in the year that he was withdrawing temporarily from politics. For Mr. Scholes, who lost his deposit, it was a seven mile journey back to his business in Bolton. Barry and Radcliffe, reflecting the national trend, increased its support for Labour, and Mr. David Enso once more returned to represent its interests at Westminster. run at 40 minute intervals over a three mile course. The start and most of the jumps are situated on rising ground facing the main enclosures. <laughs> Steeplechase was won by Mr. T. R. Sutton's Bandelex II, with Bedrock and Happy Howe coming second and third respectively. The excitement over, the fortunate ones such as their fortunes, and the not so lucky ones seek solace elsewhere. That is, of course, for those who can get in.
Seven of all in the field. Seven of all in the field. Summoned on Galvis with Emerald and Frozen Prince, second and third. But for some, it doesn't seem to matter any longer. The afternoon's excitement has perhaps been a little too much. The 1966 Whit Friday Walks marked a historic milestone for local churches when, for the first time since their inception, the Anglicans and Nonconformists united in one joint procession. In previous years, the Nonconformist churches had followed the Anglicans with a separate procession and service, but this year a single combined service was held for both groups before the walks began. Thirty churches in the district took part in the procession, taking over two hours to pass through the main streets of the town. Dense crowds lined the route under ideal weather conditions. Thank you. 
Sunseekers converged on the current lead of Chesil. With temperatures soaring into the 80s, over 3,000 people lined the banks of the pool and bathed in its water. Not least in popularity was the special shallow pool reserved for children. In 1965, the Berry Times proclaimed a start to the construction of the new centre, but it was not to be. Early disputes between the church and the council over the development of the land 
gave way to a 12-month credit squeeze by the government and work was brought to a halt. It was not until the summer of 1967 that work began once again on the project. Excavations on the site of Union Square prepared for the present day car parks. An occasion which brought with it a touch of nostalgia was the final parade of the 5th Battalion, the Lancashire Fusiliers, the territorials who have had since their foundation such long and close associations with the Tyrone. They are now merged into the TVA as part of the streamlining policy of the modern army.
Grand action of the Scout Movement was commemorated in Barry by a combined march pass through the town centre of local troops of the Scouts, Scub, Cub Scout Guides and Brownies, led by Fred Marshal Mr W Nuttall. Music was provided by the Boy Scouts Band and the band of the Berry Branch of the Salvation Army. The salute was taken by local commissioners Mrs L T Sutcliffe and Mr R F Smethurst. Field in Chesham, where a totem pole depicting the various Berry Scout troops was erected. inspection, cooking and canoeing made up some of the day's activities, ending with the traditional singing in the light of the campfire. and for many years a centre of congestion and frustration for many motorists who enter the town from Bolton and the west. Each morning and evening, peak traffic times produced chaos for driver and pedestrian alike. But help was on the way when in November work began on the new Berry Bridge roundabout. <laughs> Waterloo Street and Crosstons Road were demolished, new manholes and drains constructed, and elaborate modifications were made to the existing electricity supplies and general services.
a short time, new curb stones described the line the new system was to take and the job of surfacing was begun. built up from several layers of bitumous macadam, completed with a final coating of hot rolled asphalt to provide a smooth and durable finish. First of August 1967 the job was complete, the new direction signs were exposed and traffic began to flow around the system with an ease which gave much credit to its designers. In 1967, ever-increasing traffic demanded more and more road space, and the widening of Bolton Street meant the demolition of a whole stretch of shops and pubs. celebrated ice cream parlour by Kay Gardens was to fall victim to demolition teams. South of Princess Street lay a vast expanse of open ground known as the Mosses, which had been cleared in the 1930s but not developed. But by 1967, the few remaining streets beyond were soon to go. Across the expanse of the mosses, a broad bypass road cut through Princess Street and curved towards Market Street near the college. It was named Angoulême Way, after Berry's twin town in France.
Passed by, more familiar buildings were crumbling as the new development crept forward. Princess Street was finally severed, though it was to be reincarnated as Princess Parade in the new development. Councillor Mrs Violet Howard, new chairman of Tottington District Council, accompanied by the Mayor and Mayoress of Berry and other members of the District Council and officials, with representatives of local organisations, walks in procession on Civic Sunday. Methodist Church, which this year celebrates its centenary. will perhaps be best remembered in the North as the year Mr. William Mather, OBE, set in motion Operation Spring Clean. The children of St. Chad's make good use of the shovels and containers offered by Mr. Derek Sutcliffe, Director of Public Cleansing in Bury, and put their backs into the tidying up of Sammy's Hill.
cleansing of public buildings poses a much more difficult problem. Workmen looking like astronauts work behind tarpaulins, deafening the passers-by with their sandblasting equipment. hidden treasure this cleansing has revealed. I wonder how many realize that the dirt accumulated over half a century covered such beauty. public buildings, but the old cottages in Berry Road, Tottington have a facelift. of a famous son of Barry, the work of E. H. Bailey, R.A. Sir Robert Peel, who was created a baronet in 1800, died in 1850. A special protective coating is to be applied to the bronze statue and the plaques on the base. Still a tribute to Sir Robert, the tower on Harkham Hill was erected in the same year as the statue. for funds to clean the parish church was almost reached. A test area gave us a preview of what the church will look like when cleaning is complete. Children at Ratcliffe take time off from lessons to see Her Majesty the Queen. has come to see the results achieved in the big campaign to brighten up the Northwest, and many people connected with Operation Spring Clean will be presented to her during her visit to Matherin Platt and Dobson and Barlow. of Bradley Fold, bedecked and carpeted, takes on an important role as it becomes the scene of the Queen's departure in the Royal Train at the end of her visit to Radcliffe.
September the 17th, 1968, brought one of the most dramatic fires in the town's history, as the 67-year-old market hall was totally destroyed in a £1 million blaze. I began in the early hours of Sunday morning. My dawn reinforcements from Bolton, Farnworth, Ramsbottom and Whitefield had been called in to help the local brigade to fight the flames. Out of business by the blaze, but even as the ruins smouldered, a meeting was called at the town hall to consider their future. A few traders went out of business altogether, but for most it was just a question of temporary accommodation. Many moved into shops already scheduled for demolition in Princess Street. Several alternative sites had been suggested, but the market traders were unanimous. They wanted their old site back, and the work of clearing the debris began. An early victim was the Great Door characteristic feature of the town. Though it had survived the fire, the heat had weakened the structure, and this familiar landmark for almost 70 years was dragged unceremoniously to the ground.
in the balloons, it was business as usual on the open market, and stalls were busy with Christmas shoppers. <laughs> By the end of the year, the vast expanse of the new market hall had grown inside the shell of the old a triumph of cooperation and efficiency between the corporation and the contractors, Joseph Webbs of Berry, had brought about what would have been regarded as a miracle a few weeks before. official opening ceremony, the traders moved back, two to their original shops restored from the ruins. Inside, the stalls were placed as closely as possible to the old pattern, and with the return of the market people, much of the old character was restored. In an age when inefficiency and insecurity are commonplace, the rebirth of the market hall must rank as Berry's success story of the year. Success is temporary, for as the market hall found new life, a hundred yards away in the heart of the redevelopment area, the market hall of the future was taking shape amid a network of scaffolding. the vast new double-storey car park on the site of Union Square were ready for the day when carloads of shoppers would flow back into the town, free from parking problems. Despite the building activity going on around, several traders were already moving into the new centre. Most of the shops that had been left behind were now gone, and little remained of the once busy Princess Street. since the cup came to give lane, but on April 28th they got the next best thing, cup winners at Manchester City, straight from their triumph at Wembley two days before. The occasion was Shaker skipper Brian Turner's testimonial fund, and over 10,000 spectators turned up to see the event.
Before the match, Brown Turner introduced the mayor to members of both teams. City and an England international returned on this occasion to play with his gig lane colleagues. Throughout, in a light-hearted spirit, the game ended with a 6-5 victory for Turner's 11 and yielded 2,295 points towards his testimonial fund. The Allo Forge Band. Closely behind was the Lions float bearing the Carnival Queen, Miss Julie Sylvester. The Lions are part of an international organization started in Dallas, Texas in 1917 to bring together groups working towards a common aim, that of service to humanity. The Lions Club in Berry was formed three years ago and since that time has provided a Meals on Wheels fund for the WRBS, transport for the Inskip B, safety jackets for school children, football commentaries for patients in hospital, and any number of services for the needy of the community. The aim of the carnival was to raise money for a wide range of charities. President Mr. Jack Wright on the official platform were Miss Britain, 22 years old Valerie Holmes of London, and 79 year old Mr. Edward Smith, who was Berry's Carnival King back in 1930. Despite a lack of sunshine, over 10,000 people turned up to watch it go by.
the theme of the carnival was Lancashire through the ages. Many folks depicted various aspects of the county's history, from Pendle witches to the working conditions of the early industries. The impressive display of the handling and training of police dogs was given by officers of the Lancashire Constabulary. smash a piano, their lines provided no less than 34, complete with a barrel of sledgehammers for those with an excess of energy and those with an ear for music. The carnival raised £1,307 for charities and the indisputable success of the day was a tribute to the Lions Club of Barry, and in particular to committee chairman Barry Winterburn and his hard-working team, whose enthusiasm never faltered through long months of preparation, and whose effort provided Barry with the highlight of the year. Mm -hmm. 